start here. You want to start us off? We're going to open it up and get going, and then you can come up here. Yeah, go ahead. All right, good morning. Am I on? I don't think so. Good morning. Now we are. Okay, all right. Well, it's a beautiful summer, no, not summer, sunny morning. Welcome, uh, welcome to Zion. It's uh, an important day today. This is our annual meeting day. I hope you come prepared for that and brought some uh, goodies to share with us for lunch. So, um, yeah, I guess congratulations to the girls, Fairfield girls. We'll give them a little round of applause, huh? They made it, made it interesting, I saw. <laughs> were, you, were you a little nervous? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And I don't know how the West Noble boys, are doing okay yet? Are they still hanging in there? All right. I see some, yeah. I hope you guys are collecting the Goshen news pictures that are being posted for Austin and for Bailey. That, that's neat to see. So, yeah. A lot of good things happening. How about in your life? Anything uh, exciting going on that you want to share? I know you probably didn't all win the basketball game, but... Uh, yeah. Announcements. Are there some announcements that need to be made? The meeting today, and you'll talk about that probably. Okay. Prayer concerns. Thing we need to pray for. Besides moms with nerves, huh? <laughs> but Sunday morning you feel good, right? You're fine and everything's good, so yeah. So, so. And even I, you pulled out a squeaker over Michigan. I'm sorry about the I'm sure the Michigan fans went home shaking their head like, what in the world happened? <laughs> but it's all good, so okay. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, just a new day. We thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the freedom that we have, that we can come uh, and openly worship and praise you, and we can be a light in the community, and we just pray that we would do that. So be with us now today. Be with Pastor Jeff as he brings the message, and we just uh, pray your blessing upon our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeff has a little something you want to you do that now? Or? He'll do it later. Huh? He's, all right. <laughs> okay, let's sing some songs. So worship team, come on up. And Our first song is Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that Thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, thy life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son, Thou in me dwelling and I with Thee one. Riches I heed not nor man's empty praise, Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only first in my heart. I, King of heaven, and I treasure Thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory. To be one, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright of sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall. 
still be my vision, O ruler of all. Our next song is Open Up the Heavens. scripture this morning is out of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 44 and 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he, he hid it. And then in his joy went and sold all he had, and he bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had, and he bought it. We join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation and the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Jeff. Good morning. What a beautiful February we're having. This is just awesome. Praise the Lord. Kids, you can come on up. Some little, the little ones, come on up. Hello, Rhett. Caroline. Sydney. Mm. Alicia. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys. Well, we got a good crowd this morning. Hello, you come on up. I'll stay over here. You don't have to be afraid of me. So how are you guys this morning? We're going to talk about treasure this morning. What is, okay, apart from God, what is the most valuable thing that you yourself possess or own or have? What is the most valuable thing that you have? Something that maybe you keep in a box or I don't know if any of you have saved. Do any of you have a safe? You know what a safe is? So, okay. Um, where you keep this, this treasure or maybe you hide it. I think back in the day, back probably when um, Paul Wurlidge, is Paul here? Okay, there's probably a couple of you remember back, we used to hide our treasure, we'd dig a hole in the ground, hide it under a tree. Just, and if you do that, raise your hand. <laughs> I don't know why I looked at you, Kurt. I, Matt, I'm so sorry. I need help. All right, so. Do, do any of you have uh, something that's really, 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 really valuable to you? Anything? Can you think of anything? And you're early, so you may, you're, you're in the process of acquiring wealth, so you're at the front end. Anybody? Who has, any of you have gold coins? No gold coins? <laughs> Baseball cards. Pokemon cards. <laughs> okay, get a little better. Um, I don't know what. Well, it could be. It could maybe it's a living thing. Maybe it's like a pet. What's the most valuable thing that you have that you, you think you have? Any, anybody? No, you don't know. Well, okay, let me go to the peanut gallery here and see what we got. Wait, Rhett's got something. What's the most valuable thing you have? My pet fish. Oh, what's his name? Well, we have a lot of them. <laughs> okay. Twelve fish? You got an aquarium over there? <laughs> well, yes, you would have an aquarium because the fish would be in it. Okay. So I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like it was raining one day. Like, boy, that's a wet rain. It's a... All right. Good. So your fish are important to you. Little Wilder had, a, had one fish, and the other day it expired. Sad. Very sad. Okay. You know what expired is, right? Do you guys have anything that's really, really valuable? Okay. Um, what? Our dairy feeder calves. Dairy feeder calves. So help me understand a little bit. A dairy feeder calf, is that a, is that a boy or a girl? It's a boy. Oh, so you're going to raise it for the fair. Okay. Are you going to eat it? Good for you. All right. I was, this is, has nothing to do with these guys. I was helping uh, one of my Amish neighbors uh, pick up some stuff in Howe, and we were at a dairy farm that had, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, fleck flea, flea fleck, fleck flea, somebody correct me. They're, they're kind of orangish brown and white, and they're like a, they're, they're a milk cow or a meat cow, and I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about when, when he gets some dairy feeders, maybe. Cause Jen's always wanted a pet cow. <laughs> Show of hands, how many of you have a pet cow? At least, oh, of course. <laughs> All right. So cool. All right. So, so you guys, what? Somebody say something, Rick? Oh, I. <laughs> 
Do you, they're all pens. <laughs> all right. So you guys, you don't have any treasure yet, or you probably do, and you just don't know how valuable it is or how important it is to you. Um, but have you ever found something? Let's say you were at, you're coming out of a out of a Walmart, and you found money in the parking lot. Has that ever happened? <laughs> it has. What did you find? You found a penny? Okay, that's, that's not a treasure. Okay. I found a $5 bill. $5 bill. I suppose for a kid, $5 bill is like, hey, because what can you get with $5? Okay, so no offense. What can you get with a penny? Nothing. <laughs> However... Here's this little little money wisdom for you. If you keep track of the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves. All right. Um, okay. Uh, Five dollars. Have you found anything bigger? Have you ever found a hundred dollar bill? I don't think I've ever found a hundred dollar bill. Has anybody found a hundred dollar bill? And actually, right now, I guess there's a lot of counterfeit hundred dollar bills in fifties going around. <laughs> Maddie one time found three hundred dollars in the bathroom at the fair. Oh, we took I, it in, and you know we took it to the office. We didn't keep it, but then she ended up with it. Really? That's pretty cool. Three find it. That would be like a treasure, right? That's 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 like finding that extra French fry at the bottom of the bag. That's a bonus money. Three hundred. What would you do with three hundred dollars if you had three hundred dollars? I'm curious. What would you do with three hundred dollars? Okay. All right. All right. Sorry. No pressure. Yes. A giant squishmallow. A giant squishmallow. I actually know what a squishmallow is. That's a, do, you guys. Do you know what a squishmallow is? Okay. Good for you. All right. So we're going to talk about treasure today. Uh, we, uh, Lon read the passage and it talked about finding something and I'm going to explain more of it in detail but I was curious if you had treasure because if you had then we would talk about you know how do you protect it that kind of thing how important it is why is it important uh, and then we talk about finding treasure sometimes you stumble across something that's like so cool you're like I gotta have it have you ever saw something that you really wanted really, 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 really bad? You, okay, what was it? A horse saddle. A horse saddle. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I imagine a saddle is a big deal, right? Right, have you ever saw something you wanted really, 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 really bad? I know what it would be. A bow. A fishing rod. How about a fishing rod that's a bow? Have you ever seen one? Does that exist? <laughs> I was just making that up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Well, hey, I'm going to let you guys have some candy. And so take what you want out of there. Take one and go back and sit down. And we'll talk about treasure. You guys were mildly helpful. <laughs> Mild. So cute. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. A couple of side things before I get into the message. Today is Blanket Sunday, and so if you have your Blanket Sunday offering, that will go in the offering plate. If you'd still have it with you and you'd like to put it in the offering plate, uh, I probably have one of the deacons. Oh, they're, they're gone. The deacons have disappeared. Okay. Um, but your envelopes, they go in, and you know what? You know why they're gone? Because they have the offering plates. Does anybody have this and needs to get rid of it? If you do, I'll have it. I'll have um, our local town marshal. <laughs> Bob, good to see you back there, brother. Uh, Robert, Robert. Um, Rick, are you just messing with me or do you have yours? Oh, is there? You know what? Take it. And then take it back to, um, give them to Ruby? Yeah. Ruby, do you get them? Rick will collect them and give them to Ruby. So 
This is one of the things that we do every year. If, you, if, been, if you've been here, you know that. The other thing we do, I keep wanting to talk about it, and I keep forgetting about it. So, at the end of the year, you know, and actually, we just had a meeting about Operation Christmas Child. And it was a great meeting. And um, the cool thing is, it looks like we have an opportunity to partner with Bur Oak in uh, doing the Operation Christmas Child, which we do. And at the end of the year, we do this thing called a thank offering. Okay? And... And so I'm learning this because I'm relatively new. I've only been here now almost six years. So um, all year long, you take money and you put it in something. We actually have a mason jar with a bank top on it at home, and that's where all our change goes. And then at the end of the year, we bring that in for the thank offering. Several years ago, I did this with uh, my, my kids uh, in the Bible study downstairs, and we did the Operation Christmas Child we did a little box that we could put change in. So giving is a way of saying, I love you. It just happens to tie in with the message today. I love God. Uh, giving is a heart condition. Um, so uh, all year long, we're putting money in a thing. And then at the end of the year, you're going to hear us talk about, hey, this is the Sunday that you bring in your thank offering. And I think there's been a couple of those Sundays where people look at me like, what are you talking about, Willis? Uh, you know, what's going on? And so nobody got that, did they? Who, what you're talking about, Willis? Did anybody get that? Thank God, all right. Um, so that's what we do. I think, uh, Lois, did you bring in... Lois is gone. She may have brought in some little banks in there. Oh yeah, these things here. Uh, and... Tupperware, you, and you can grab one of these, or you can use whatever you want, or make your own box, um, whatever, to save money through the year, and then eventually you're going to hear us say, bring your thank offering, and what we do with Operation Christmas Child is going to blow your mind. And even more, I just, when he came in and he was telling the stories, he played us a video of a, of a girl that her shoebox changed her life. But then he left. He just, he, he threw this story out there. I got to tell you this story. It's not a long story. He just said, you know, let me tell you what happened with one of the shoeboxes. Because we pack shoeboxes, so you kind of know what goes in them, right? So they're in Africa, and the pastor just passed out the shoeboxes to all the kids. They got their boxes. And he said, would one of you like to pray? One of the little boys gets up, comes up front, and this is what he prays. Lord, let there be a suit in my shoebox. That's what he prayed. And then he went and sat down. And do you know what was in his shoebox? Guess. A suit. The fit. That's what God can do. Does that blow your mind? Man, I'd be like, Lord, let there be a Bow fishing rod. You know. <laughs> All right. Let's get into the message. Let's do this. All right. Last week we talked, first slide. Last week we talked about how God loved us first. He is. He's, he's the one who loved us first. And we talked about the way he loves us. And the question that, that pops up in my mind is how do we know that? How do we know that God loved us first? I want you to think about that just for a second. How do you know that? You don't know it because you just like woke up and like, hey, I think God loved me first. You, you don't, it's not how it is. We know that because the Bible told us that. And so the Bible tells us the how, the way, the why of how God loves us. God is telling us over and over and over in his word how he loves us. And because of this profound revelation, it helps us learn how to love God, ourselves, and others. I thought it was kind of neat yesterday. We got up early and went out to the Croc Center in South Bend, which, by the way, that's a nice place, the Croc Center. If you've not been there, man, um, and to watch a basketball game and... Um, there was a homeless man just down from the, the homeless, the Salvation Army, but it was cool. The one thing that he had in his hand was his Bible. And he was panhandling, and 
and I get that. Some, that may be the only thing he can do or maybe the only job he can actually hold. But he, he had said, so he could light a smoke, he had set his Bible up on the window to hold it in place. And it, it just blessed me. I'm like, and I said to Jen, I said, you know what, in whatever situation you are, if you have that, you have everything. You really do. And if you don't believe that, and we're going to talk about that today, then maybe these two things are missing. But anyways, we know God loves us first because of the word. And so it allows me the opportunity to say to you that this, this is more than even being profound. This is supernaturally profound in the power, in the things that it communicates, the power that it has, and the way that it can help make a difference in our lives. And so I don't want you to miss that. We know that because the Bible tells us that. Uh, and so because of that, the way God communicates his love to us, it's the key. It helps us understand something. Not just about God's relationship with us or our relationship with him, but our relationship with each other. I'm going to give you the key to success in every relationship, in, every rela in, in your marital relationships, in your relationships with your friends, your relationships with your kids, your relationships with strangers. This is the key communication right Derek it's communication it is the key he's teaching us the importance of communication um, communication is the one thing that can help us have a meaningful vibrant passionate relationship with anybody because knowledge is power if you know something you can do something about it right when you don't know something you're in the dark you're confused um, Communication is the key. I think in all marital counseling, that's probably the number one. It's interesting, I was reading news feeds this morning and one of them was like, you know, uh, the other thing that really ruins or wrecks marriages is money. And it can, it doesn't have to though, right? Actually, and, and I, I would argue that oftentimes money ruins churches. We got so much money now, we got to get all weird about it. You know, money makes us weird, doesn't it? Um... But we're talking about communication. So, I already said this, but communication is the one thing that helps us have meaningful, vibrant, passionate relationships. Is there anybody in here who doesn't want that? It's like, I would just rather have a mediocre relationship. I don't, I don't want to have any success in a relationship. I, none of us would say that, right? We want to have the best relationship we can have. So last week we talked about God love is loving us extravagantly. So the question we're going to wrestle with today is how do we love him back? That's what I want to wrestle with. How do we love him back? He's communicating his love to us. How are you? How am I communicating our love back to him? You know, it's a two-way street, right? Communication is a two-way street. Would you agree? You ever, you ever do an exercise in active communication? I'm going to do it with you right now. All right. I don't have a tennis ball, so we'll use um, Snickers. All right. Um, Molly. It's like, oh, no. Molly. How are you today, Molly? <laughs> okay. So here's what, you, here's what happened. I asked her a question, and she just said, good. That's not bad, but it's not great. It's like, where did the conversation die? <laughs> With Molly. Let's try this again. You ask me a question. <laughs> Any question. Are you okay? <laughs> Do you want me to go to somebody else? Okay, Alicia. <laughs> ask me a question. Jen, how are you? Oh, that's so nice that you asked how I'm doing. I am doing great. I'm having a great day. How are you doing? It's good. That was better. So did you notice what I did? When we're doing active listening, uh, how, anybody else in the military? Military is all about active listening. Sergeant says something and you say, yes, Sergeant. You repeat the question, actually. 
Active listening is letting somebody know you heard what they say and then you're responding and you, and so it's like playing catch. I'm going to play catch with this Snickers bar. Can you catch? Yeah, you played softball. You could catch. So I say, hey, how are you doing? And then she says, hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing? And she throws it back. And then I'm like, oh, man, how's, uh, how's things going with the kids? We keep having a conversation. But I think in our culture sometimes we, we end the conversations. Do you know what I'm saying? And we don't get any further. We don't get any deeper. We got some law enforcement in here. How hard is it when you're at, a, at an accident to get the information, you know, about what's going on? Probably really difficult. Uh, people aren't very good at telling you all the details. You have to, do you have to extract it? Would that be a fair assessment? Is it, do you have to get it out of them? Because we're not great at communication. If you're not great in communication, and you're, would you like that? I feel like, Alicia? <laughs> Gerald? Okay. All right. So communication is the key. And so um, active communication. And so the reason I do that is to say this, because I, I really do. I think when it comes to God, God is extravagantly loving us. And he's like, how are you today? And I'm fine. And then we go on with our day. And God's like, I, I honestly believe God is interested in the dialogue in the relationship. I don't know why we treat him like we do. You know? Um, I don't. And we're going to explore that. So I want to, next slide, I want to get a few things out of the way. Just as we're going to explore this. And the first one is this. Because I know some of us are competitive. You know, we have a competitive nature. Everything, you know, I got to win at everything that I do. And, and you're never going to love God better than God loves you. That's great news for us. That's how extravagant a lover he is. He loves us better than we're able to love him back. Okay? Um, and so, think about it. I wouldn't expect my child to love me back like I love him. I just do that because he's my child. And I can't help but want to do that. And, and there is no expectation for the child to love me like I love the child. It's just what I do. And that's true with God. So I want to take you off the hook. You're not here to... I want you to improve in your love relationship with God, but I'm not expecting you to be like insane at it or stupid at it or OCD at it. I just, just want you to understand, He's better at it than I am. You know what? In my marriage... Jen is a better lover of me than I'm a lover of her. Part of that is because I'm a man. Okay? And that's not to knock men. It's just we're, we're less feeling-based. Does that make sense? Or at least I'm less feeling-based. I'm more matter-of-fact. You know? Um, and she's, you know, she's, a, she's, she's good. When, if she went to the hospital and something happened to her and I saw it, I would pass out on the floor. If we went to the hospital and something is happening to me, you know what she's doing? She's standing above me. She's caressing my forehead. She's telling me it's going to be okay. That's the difference between the two of us. Okay? Um, and God is just this magnificent lover of his people. He is. So don't worry about it. The second thing is this. Have a relationship with God. If you are a believer, have a relationship. If you don't have... If, if you were to evaluate right now, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I have a relationship with God like I have a relationship with my spouse or a best friend or my children or even, you know, my neighbor. Have a relationship. Do something. Okay? Um, because that's what he wants. Um, and the last thing is don't just do nothing. Is that what I got there? Don't do nothing. I think many of us do this. We think because God loves us so well and he's God, I don't have to do anything. And you probably don't. God will love you anyways. For God so loved the world that he gave while we were still sinners. God loved us. God loves us. He loves me. God is love. And that's just his nature. But we don't have to do nothing. 
And I think too many people, that's where we live. I don't have to do anything. It's like, it's like cheap grace. I know he's going to forgive me, so I don't care. Let me ask you a question. If that was your marital relationship, how long would it last? If, if, if all you did, did, dude, if all you did was take and take and take and take and never give anything back, what kind of relationship is that? Actually, uh, we have an example of that. How many of you are familiar with the Dead Sea? Can anybody tell me why the Dead Sea is dead? What? It doesn't. It only receives and nothing exits out of it. That's why it's so salt-based, because it's constantly taking in, and eventually it gets so much sediment and so much salt that it kills it. There should be this back and forth, and so we're going to explore that. Next slide. And so in the last couple of weeks, this is the passage that God has laid on my heart. I actually thought about using it last week, and the truth is... Um, it's relevant, and I'll explain why it's relevant uh, in relation to love because of the nature of what's happening here. So in the passage, this is Matthew chapter 13 all the way down in verses 44 and 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure. And the first thing I want to say here is in the scriptures, this, this term kingdom of heaven is often interchangeable with the kingdom of God. So if I was Jewish, we would never say the name of God. The, if you see in your Bible where L-O-R-D, Lord, is capitalized, that's Yahweh. They would never say Yahweh. In fact, they invented vowel markers uh, so they could say like Adonai or something else. But so the kingdom of heaven could be also the kingdom of God, and that's how I want you to understand it. The kingdom of God... Um, hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and he bought that field. And again, the kingdom of God is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found it, one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. And so how does that correlate today? And I'm going to share something I picked up from John Piper. I just love what John says about this passage. He says this, we learn one main thing from these two parables. The kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off. I want you to think about that for a minute. The possessing, and again, possessing isn't the right word. I don't want you to think like you can possess God because the truth is it's God who wants to possess us. He, he's the one holding us and keeping us and, 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 you know, taking care of us. But he wants to have a relationship with us. And is having a relationship with God worth the trade-off? Is it that important to you? And I just want you to think about that for a second. And I think that's hard for us, and part of that's hard because your relationship with God isn't necessarily, I don't want to say it. I think because we think of God in our head, or, and, and we're not necessarily experiencing a relationship like I might be experiencing with my wife, or with my friends, or with my children, that it's not the same kind of relationship and that would be your mistake. You can have the same kind of relationship with God that you have with people. But you have to cultivate it. You have to want it. You have to work at it. You have to act like you can actually have a relationship with God. Like you can talk to God. Like you can hear from God. Like you could be touched by God. That you could be directed by God that you could be moved by God, that you could feel in your heart of hearts the presence of God or the words of God. The kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off. Having the omnipotent, saving reign of Christ in our lives is so valuable that if we lose everything in order to have it, it is a joyful sacrifice. If we lose everything we have, that's what the parable is relating. This guy changed his 
his economic status, his lifestyle, everything to possess this one thing that he found. Now, there's one thing that's, that's, that's true for us that's not true in the parable. Somebody answer this question for me. What does it cost to have Jesus? Does it cost you any money? Does it cost you money? No. We don't have to buy anything, do we? Do you think that what God has offered us is free to everyone? What? Yeah, it's free. But Jesus tells this parable. He found this treasure and he went and he eliminated things from his life so that he could have this, this one thing. And I think part of it is because he, this treasure is something that he had to have. And what was his attitude? Because I think this is true sometimes. I think when we think of church or we think of God, we think of it as a burden, as a, um, you know, and you might have thought this this morning. I was pretty happy when I got, to, got, you know, got up this morning. Like, I get to go to church today. In fact, I left before Jen because I couldn't wait to get here. We're going to have a meeting today. <laughs> That's the crazy stuff. That's the icing on the cake. <laughs> Um, you know what when I was here today I didn't get to stay in the, the Bible study but as I'm going down the halls all I hear is laughter and giggling and happiness and, and I'm like this is the best place to be his attitude was joy it wasn't a, it wasn't a burden and I get it we're people and we're shallow and selfish and insensitive and you know, we don't like things that impinge upon our time or on our resources. And that's not what's happening here. I just need you to understand that. That's not what's happening here. Okay? All right. So, next slide. I'm just going to share two things with you um, that are important. First of all, we're not going to go through Song of Songs. It's, it's a long book. And it's, um, it's rated R. And... Uh, um, and just since it is Valentine's Day month, if you're looking for really cool lines for your wife, read that book. <laughs> There's some good stuff in there. You know, your neck is like a tower. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. It's more provocative. It's a very provocative book. All right. But in it, if you read it, there is uh, the beloved, the lover, and... Um, the, the maidens who say some things. And I pulled this one line out of here. I will search for the one my heart loves. Because if you read the book, she's always looking for her lover. Always. And when they find each other, now it's a party. Okay? It's, it's, it is rich in all this imagery. And there's so many commentaries that would tell you so many things. But I'll tell you this. God put it in the Bible for a reason because it helps us understand that God wants to have this deep, meaningful, passionate relationship with his people. And we don't talk like that because we, whenever we talk about intimacy issues, we, we, we let the world taint those things. Makes it dirty. There's nothing dirty about love because God made it and he gave it to us. So, if you were to read it, whenever she's not with him, She's always looking for him, even at the risk of her own life. She's always searching for the one that her heart loves. And so the one thing that if you read that, it's desire. It's desire. I thought it ironic in the song that we sang that you picked that you didn't even know where we were headed. You, well, maybe you had an idea. Maybe I mentioned it. And I don't know if you picked it for that reason. In Open Up the Heavens, it says awakening desire. That passage, the Song of Songs actually says... Because uh, I used to teach high schoolers, don't awaken love before you're ready. Because you don't know what you're getting into. Love is, you know. And I know we throw around love like, oh, I love chocolate. You know, I love the Hoosiers. But it's not the same as I love Jen. You know, and the way that Jen loves me or I love my kids or I love my grandkids. Awakening desire. I better put that back up there. <laughs> The next one.
desire. I'm going to come back to this slide. I want you to go to the next slide. So here's what I was going to do. So I struggled. I wanted to do what was easy, just being honest. I was going to show you tangible ways to communicate with God, to communicate love with God, reading His Word, prayer, worship, serving, giving. And I could go on with all kinds of tangible things that we do that we think show love. And they do. They, they, do, they do show love. But what's behind those things? What's behind why I read the Word or the way that I worship or how I pray? It's these two things. Now go back to the other slide. That's the reason it's blank because I'm not going to show you all those things. You do those things. Show of hands. How many people have prayed? How many people worship? Yeah. How many people serve? We're doing those things. Now, there's a difference between them. If, they're, if they don't have behind them desire, and then I added Ruth. And by the way, the women's Bible study is going to do a study on Ruth. That's the group that meets in the nursery. And if anybody's interested, let them know, and I'll get another book. But it, there's this line in Ruth, and oftentimes this is used in weddings. And this is what Ruth says to her mother-in-law. She says, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. You see, uh, Naomi, she went to a distant land. She actually went to Moab. Moab is a nation that came about between the Ill illegitimate relationship between Lot's daughters and Lot. Moab and Am, uh, Am, uh, the Ammonites. And there's a famine. They go to Moab. And she ends up marrying one of the boys, and he ends up dying. But what happens is the, the power of the relationship that she has with Naomi is this. If you're going back, I want to go with you. I don't want to stay here. Because where you are is better than where I am right now. And church, I want you to understand that about God. Wherever you are in your life, if you have God with you, you're in the best place. It's better to have God than not have God. The world doesn't quite get that. And the passage that I read about the treasure, he went and sold everything he had and his attitude was, I'm glad to do this because I gained this. You know what? I think if God was money, might be easier. Churches might be fuller. But he's not money. He's God. We, and I could say so many things. Money's just the one I think that we, you know, that's so important to us. And it is because we have to pay bills. And if you don't have any, you might be a homeless guy standing on the corner uh, next to the Salvation Army with your Bible on the window trying to light a smoke. Let me ask you a question. Does God love that man? Does he love him as much as he loves me? Yeah. And probably, I don't know how he got to where he got. But his life matters. Actually, I would argue every life matters. Every life. Worship team, come on up. And we'll do the last song. Here's all I'm going to say. We're already doing things that we show we love God. And some of us, they might be intentional, uh, unintentional. And, and you know what? Even if you, uh, to me, this, I would find this offensive. But I think oftentimes, and I don't want to disrespect it because I think any love towards God is love towards God. But God does say this in Isaiah 113. He says, listen, stop. Stop bringing these offerings and this worship because it's offensive to me. And you know why it's offensive to him? Because there's no heart in it. Do you want to be loved by somebody whose heart's not in it? I want you to think about that for a second. Do you want to be loved by somebody whose heart's not in it? No. Why would I love God 
like he's just some kind of magical ATM who does whatever I ask and nothing's ever expected of me. I think you could argue from Scripture that if that was your attitude, I wouldn't expect anything. And I don't, I'm be the first to tell you that God loves everybody, but the Bible teaches me some principles. Does he want all your money? When he talks about giving, does God want all your money? How much? If you were to pick a number. Pick a number. <laughs> all he asked for is 10. Tell you what, though, if you gave 100%, he'd blow your mind. And you know, the same is true. If you actually had a meaningful relationship with God and God started to pour, really pour the love that he wants to pour out in your life, you would be like, mm, boom! That is awesome! You, you know what I'm saying? You're going to think this is weird. <laughs> I, I remember these guys were talking about their first dates and so I had to get out before I was used anything in a sermon but I I remember I, you know I don't know that I remember exactly where for me it was your back door you say it was at the gravel pit but I remember the first kiss actually I remember two things I remember our first kiss and our second first kiss then I was in the army still and we were at a wedding, and we were on the dance floor, and we kissed again. Those are my two favorite memories, and I'm telling you, when, when we kissed, it was... <laughs> God gave us those things. If I read Song of Songs, chapter 1, let me kiss him with kisses of my mouth. Let him bring me into the, uh, you know, into his chambers. We're going. The intimacy is going to happen. God wants to have this really dip, <laughs> dip, deep, meaningful, rich relationship. And and he's not asking for all our money, right? God says, how many days? How many days are you to commit to me? All of them. Answer. All of them. How many? He's asking you to honor him on what? One day. I'm just making the point. He's not asking for you to be ridiculous. Does that make sense? He's asking for a little bit. In church, answer this question. Do we give him the little bit? No. We probably do not. If I were to add up all the time I spend with God, if it totaled out a day, I would be shocked. If I were, yeah, I don't know if I were to add up my giving, would it equal 10%? Probably not quite there. Does God stop loving me? No, but I would make this argument. God himself says in his word, if you give 100%, if you, if you make it every day, I will not hold back the floodgates. I will pour out so much blessing on you, you can't what? Man, I want to say you can't handle the truth, but you can't contain it. You can't contain it all. So, two things. I want you to work on two things. Desire. That sounds weird. The pastor's talking about desire today. Do you desire God? Do you really want God? When I, when I heard a, he was a prisoner of war, and I'm just thinking about this. I wish I could ask him this. And he said the one thing that they, all the prisoners worked so hard on, etching this on the floor of their cell when they were in, this was probably, I'm going to say, either Korea. He had to be maybe a, a veteran of Korea. Because in Korea, I think they kept you in Korea. But there weren't really walls. You couldn't really get away. And he said the one thing that they did more than anything, they were all trying to remember all the scriptures that they had learned at their mother's feet when they were children. Because they said that was the one thing that sustained them all. God's love letters to them. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though, if it ever happened that I should walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear any evil for his rod and his staff. They comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy, and he anoints my head with oil, and my cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's how my God loves me. And those words, they're like oil. They restore my soul. If I lost everything and still have God, I have lost nothing. Nothing. Would you stand? Our song is God So Loved.
cares. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Every church service should end this way, and I'm not great about it because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but God has extended his love to us, and we can receive that, and in doing so, he changes our circumstance. He changes our position. He changes our state. He changes our condition. Why would we not want to receive that? I'll tell you why. Because you've bought in with the world. And we actually owe the world something. And we're tied to it. Can't easily break our ties with it. It's kind of what the parable illustrates. With joy, he broke all his ties with the world so he could possess this one thing. You don't have to be afraid of anything. I remember when I ran to the altar. And God has made me a better man. I'm in the process of becoming a better man. Not because of anything I've ever done, but because of everything he has done. And today, that can be yours as well. If you want to know that, that God who has sent his son to redeem lost people, I would be glad to talk with you about that at the end of the service. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the way you love us. Help us. Give us the strength, the courage, and the faithfulness to love you back better tomorrow than we did today. Help us to increase in our desire for you and our joy in walking with you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.